Here I want to go through shielding, and shielding is specific to uh, when we're looking at periodic trends. So we're looking at atomic radii, ionic radii, ionization energies, electron affinities, and electronegativities. Uh, shielding gets brought up. And so I want to go through and I want to translate that and go through and look at a couple things that are not particularly great about it and kind of trying to fix some of those. So, so shielding gets brought up when we look at things that we would not necessarily expect. Okay, so if we look at data for ionization energies, and we look at the fact that as we move across the period, that for the most part, our ionization energies get larger as we go across. So as we're going from here to here to here to here to here, generally speaking, it's going up across the period. And so there's some, some disconnect with that, but for the most part, that's fairly accurate that, that that trend exists. And likewise, when we look at atomic radius, as we move across the period, the radius gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller with a couple discontinuities in there. And, and that's counterintuitive, especially when we look at radius, because why would something get smaller when we have more stuff in it? Okay. And so what we do is, is we try and explain that by looking at kind of some, some pictures of that. And I think that the way we draw the pictures can be very deceptive. So when we draw, let's say, a sodium atom using a Bohr model, and we have 11 protons in here, and we have two electrons, and then eight electrons, and then one electron in the 3s1 orbital. We're drawing those electrons in a, in a paired sense, because they're, they're paired within an orbital state, uh, and we're drawing them as a stationary state. We're drawing that this electron is here, and this electron is here. And to a student who's new, then we would see that as being, well, those two electrons are really close, and therefore they must repel a lot. Okay. And so when we start to get into the logistics of how this repulsion works, you have to break free from this frame of reference. You have to understand that these electrons are not stationary, that they are in motion constantly in there. And so this electron is not just here, but it's also here, and it's also there, and it's also there. And we have to average things out over time. Additionally, we will say things like, this electron here is not shielded by this electron. It's shielded by these two. Okay? There's a few problems with that. Number one, Shielding is a terrible word. Shielding implies that this electron here blocks this one from seeing the nucleus. Like it actually gets in its way, and that somehow disrupts something. So first of all, a little background physics. If I have a positive charge and a negative charge, there's an attraction between this. They pull on each other towards each other. If I then stick a third charge in the middle, those forces of these two do not change. They are completely unaffected by this. What happens is that in addition to those forces, I will get a new force where these two will repel each other, and then these two will now attract each other. And that will change how the motion of these nets from that, but the force that existed before is still present there. So when I say that this electron shields, I don't mean that it like disrupts or interferes with. What I actually mean is that there is a repulsion from, from this electron on this one, where these two push on each other, and, and that the, the inward pull of the nucleus then is going to have a resistance, not so much to the pull itself, this is still pulling with the same amount of force, but now it has another push being added to this electron in the opposite direction. Okay, So shielding itself as a word is not particularly good. And then, let's go back and look at some of the uh, some of the electrons in this. So we have our 11 protons, our 2 electrons, our 8 electrons, and our 3s1 electron. So what your chemistry teacher will probably say is they'll say something along the lines that these electrons will shield this one, these electrons will shield this one, but ones that are in the same energy level do not shield each other. That's not exactly true. What is actually true is that the electrons that are in here shield each other very little. So, so the electrons that are in the same energy level will usually contribute a shielding that's somewhere to be about 30 to 35 percent of how much of a pull of a single proton is in that particular atom. Okay? So if you're in the same energy level, N, then you'll have a little bit of shielding from each electron in that energy level. If you're in the electron energy level below, then about 85 percent of the pull of a single proton will be how much repulsive force you get. Okay? And if you're two or more, then pretty much each electron there is the equivalent repulsion to, to a single proton. 
But I want to look at how that comes about. If I'm this electron and this electron, they seem really close according to my drawing. Why don't they repel each other a lot? Well, they do. But, if you look at the directionality, this one's pushing it this way. This one's pushing it this way. Well, if I flip-flop those two electrons and put these two here later, this one's going to be pushed in the other direction, and this one's going to be pushed in the other direction. And so, when I add this and this together, and mark this, this one and this one together, I get a little bit of repulsion, but most of the sideways push cancels. And likewise, when I add these two vectors together, this pushes to the right, this pushes to the left, there's very little outward push from that. So the sum over time for two electrons that are in the same energy level is mostly left and right, and therefore mostly cancels. And so we see very little shielding, not none, but very little shielding within an energy level. Okay. If you go to the level below that, now we're going to see you know, that this electron here is pushing on this one, and now it's pushing a lot more out. It's pushing this way, it's pushing that way. And keep in mind that sometimes these electrons will be over on this side, and then they won't push as much. But that over time, this repulsion adds up to be about 80-85% of what the attraction of one of those 11 protons is. So, when we get into chemistry, we typically say things like, if you want to calculate effective nuclear charge, that it's how many protons you have minus how many electrons that are between that energy level and the, and the nucleus. In real life, what we should be doing is doing that calculation for all of the really core electrons, but only 0.85 for each electron in the energy level below, and about 0.3 for each electron in the energy level that exists. So, a lot of things that don't really make sense start to make sense for that. So, so, if we incorporate in this fact that there's a little bit of shielding, and then a lot of shielding, and then a full proton's worth of shielding, then some things start to make more sense. For example, if we look at multiple ionization energies. Okay, so here is fluorine. So, we have nine protons, and we have nine electrons. Okay, and I come in and I remove an electron. Okay, and it takes so much energy. So, so the length of that is how much energy I have to pull with. And it's a lot, because there's, there's very little shielding here, and, and there's a lot of charge really close by. When I go to take the next electron away, according to, according to what you're taught in regular chemistry, this should be just as easy to take away. And it never is. Well, why not? Well, because that electron you took away was pushing on this one a little bit. Not a lot. But 30 to 35 percent of one of these nine protons pull. So when I go to take this one away, because there's less pushing it out, I'm going to have to pull a little bit harder than I did the last time. And so this one's going to require a little more energy. If I go to take away the next one, I'm going to have to pull a little bit harder than that. Now, when I get down to this electron, that's when you're going to see a big spike. So these are going to progressively get longer, but all of a sudden you get to this one and boom, that thing's going to be extremely difficult to remove. Okay? So when we go through shielding, it's important to keep in mind this exception when you start to look at actual data. So when we start to go through and look at ionization energies, you can see that as we take away electrons, it becomes progressively more difficult because I'm reducing the amount of shielding. And that means that now I have to pull more to, to compensate for the lack of push from that repulsion of the electron to begin with. Okay? So that's something that's important to keep in mind when you're looking at shielding is the fact that it's really just the electrons pushing that is in addition to the nu nucleus pulling and furthermore that, that it's really not all or nothing like we make it out when we simplify this down to be that it's a little more complicated to that and so when we see data that, that kind of shows that 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 would be why that is.